Welcome back to Unit 2.7 Electrochemistry and just before we get started into this video I'm just going to do a quick recap of this process electrolysis. So we looked at the word electrolysis and looked at literally what does this word mean so we split it up into two different parts electro and lysis. So first of all the end bit lysis what does that mean? It means to split up or to break down and the part electro it refers to the fact that this process uses electricity. So literally this word means to split up or break down using electricity. Now that's not the official definition that you need to learn. Um, the official definition is the decomposition of a liquid electrolyte using a direct current of electricity. So this process is involving electricity and essentially what we're doing is splitting up compounds into their original elements. So let's have a quick recap of what actually happens during electrolysis. So we've got a diagram below with our electrochemical cell, and that's just basically the overall apparatus. And um, we have our two electrodes, our anode and our cathode, and they are uh, suspended in our uh, liquid electrolyte. And you can see that there are ions in our liquid electrolyte. You can see that there are positive and negative ions. What are the positive ions called? They are called cations, so think of the T in the middle as a um, positive sign. And what about the negative ions? They are called anions. So at the minute in our electrochemical cell, we're assuming that the electricity is switched off, that the current is not flowing because our ions are just in the solution. But if we were to turn the electricity on, if we were to attach a power supply, the ions are going to be attracted to the electrodes. So we have to think about the charge on each of our electrodes. We need to remember, and this is a little bit confusing, that the anode is our positive electrode. And then we need to remember that our cathode is our negative electrode. That might seem wrong at the minute because cations are positive, so why is the cathode negative? But we'll see now. Because when we turn on the electricity, when we pass electricity through this circuit, the ions are attracted to the electrodes. What will be attracted to the anode? Well, it's the anions that are attracted to the anode. So the anions will literally move over to the anode because they're attracted to the anode because opposite charges attract. Remember the anode is positive. And what will happen to the cations then? They will be attracted to the cathode because the cations are positively charged and the cathode is negatively charged. So when the electricity is flowing, the ions are attracted to the oppositely charged electrode. So anions go to the anode and cations go to the cathode. So what happens at these electrodes? Well, something happens, uh, something different happens at each of the electrodes. What we want is that, um, for these ions to go back to being atoms. So we can see that the anions are negatively charged. That means they have too many electrons. They've got extra electrons uh, to spare. So what they want to do is lose electrons. So essentially what happens is electrons are passed into the anode. So they want to lose electrons. What do we call the loss of electrons? The loss of electrons is oxidation. So we learned that in our previous topic. Think oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons. So at the anode, the anions are attracted to it and they lose electrons so that they then become atoms. They'll not be attracted to the anode anymore um, and they um, Generally, a gas is formed here, so they will bubble off. At the cathode, then, something different happens because you can see that at the cathode, we have cations. So what do they need to do um, to become overall neutral and charged, um, to have no overall charge to become an atom again? Well, they're positive because they have a lack of electrons. So what happens is at the cathode is that the cations gain electrons. So we see gain of electrons happens at the cathode. And the gain of electrons is described as reduction. 
So reduction happens at the cathode. Again, think oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So at the cathode, our cations pick up electrons. They then um, will become atoms and have no overall charge. Um, and so they will fall away from the cathode as well. Um, this time, generally a metal is formed at the cathode and therefore um, the metal will sink to the bottom and it will appear as beads of our shiny grey metal. So electrolysis is a way of splitting up compounds into the individual elements that they are made up of. Um, and the anode is our positive electrode, our cathode is our negative electrode. And so what that means um, is that we learned that at the anode it will always be the non-metal that forms. And that's because it is um, the anions that are attracted to the anode and that will be our non-metal as part of our compound. And at the cathode then, it's our metal that forms and that's because um, our metals are going to be the cations um, and so metals will be formed at the cathode. So that's your uh, recap of electrolysis and what we're going to do now is look at an industrial example of um, how electrolysis is used to extract a metal from its ore. So we are now going to look at the extraction of aluminium and we're going to look at it on an industrial scale. So allium, aluminium is a reactive metal that has to be obtained by electrolysis because of its position on the reactivity series. And that's something that we will look at when we um, cover the reactivity series topic. It's unit 2.1. Um, but for now, you just need to know that aluminium has to be extracted by electrolysis. And it's extracted from its ore, which is called bauxite. Bauxite is spelled B-A-U-X-I-T-E. That's often a one mark question. What is the ore of aluminium called? And it is bauxite. Um, so basically, aluminium doesn't exist uncombined in nature, and that's because it's a reactive metal. So any aluminium that occurs naturally is um, aluminium combined with oxygen and also water as well. So you're told here in your notes, bauxite is hydrated aluminium oxide. Um, just a bit like um, that will remind you of the name for rust is hydrated iron oxide. Um, bauxite is hydrated aluminium oxide. It just means aluminium combined with oxygen, but also bonded to some water um, as well. So um, you need to know the process of the extraction of aluminium, which is essentially just an electrolysis extraction. Um, but there's a couple of extra details that you need to know, because so far we've looked at examples that we might carry out in the lab and on a small scale. Um, but this is um, carried out on a very, very big scale. And it's important that you listen carefully and that you take in these details, because this is very often asked in exams. So the first step of the process is that the bauxite is purified to give pure aluminium oxide um, and that's written twice there in your notes so um, it doesn't need to be written there twice and that is sometimes called al alumina. The impurities that are removed are silica and iron 3 oxide and um, so those are removed um, by the purification so that happens first before we put it into the electrochemical cell and that's to avoid impurities actually going into the cell. The aluminium oxide that we form from that purification is then dissolved in something called molten cryolite. So cryolite is a chemical and it is um, used in the molten form, it's a liquid form, because this all, as you remember, needs to happen um, with the electrolyte, i.e. the aluminium oxide in this case needs to be um, molten in order for electrolysis to work, in order for the ions to be free to move to the different electrodes. Um, the purpose of molten cryolite we'll come back to, but very briefly, it has two functions. It reduces the melting point of aluminium oxide and it also increases the conductivity. And so we're going to have a look um, on the next page about how that um, saves costs. Once we have done those two steps, so we purify, we dissolve it in molten cryolite and then it's time for the electrolysis to take place. 
So down in the second half of page eight, you'll see the diagram of the electrochemical cell. Now what you'll notice is that this diagram looks a little bit different to what we've been using. And that's again, because this is happening on, a, on an industrial scale. So it doesn't just work doing it in one little evaporating basin or one little beaker or um, crucible. Um, we need to do this on in a massive tank, essentially, um, in a steel cell. And this is carried out on a, a very large scale. So what you'll notice, a couple of differences. You'll see that um, our uh, anode and our cathode are not just um, rectangular rods that are in our liquid electrolyte. electrolyte. You'll see your anodes are up here um, and you've got three of them in this diagram. Again, they are made out of graphite. Remember, graphite is a good choice of material for an electrode because it conducts electricity and it's not reactive. We covered that in our first video. Um, so there are anodes there and remember that anodes are positively charged. And then you might think, well, where is our cathode? Our cathode is labelled here. Essentially, it's the lining of our cell. And I'll highlight it here. You might want to do that as well in your notes. So our cathode actually runs along the outside of the cell. Um, and that is your cathode. And remember that it's negatively charged. I've never seen a question where you have had to actually draw this but um, it's useful to recognize this diagram and recognize the different components so that you can see where the anode and the cathode um, are but it's important more so that you know what happens at each of these electrodes. You might not have photocopied very well in your notes so you might want to um, draw the surface of your electrolyte there and um, just so that you can see that. So that's going to be your aluminium ore, your aluminium oxide um, dissolved in molten cryolite at about 950 degrees C. And that's to make sure that it is kept molten because we know that electrolysis does not work on a solid electrolyte because the ions are not free to move. And so therefore they won't be able to go to the different electrodes. So it might be worth writing there that your ore is aluminium oxide. So our electrolyte in this example is aluminium oxide. So let's have a look at what happens at each of the electrodes. So first of all, let's look at what happens at the anode. So what is attracted to the anode? Well, we must remember first of all that the anode is positively charged. And so that means it's the anions that will be attracted to it. In aluminium oxide, what is our anion going to be? Our negatively charged ion is going to be our oxide ions. So it's our oxide ions that are attracted to the positive anode. What do they need to do? Well, remember at the anode, we see oxidation. We see loss of electrons because our oxide ions are negatively charged and therefore we need them to lose electrons to form atoms. So let's have a think about what's happening in terms of a half equation. We're starting with oxide ions, which have a charge of two minus. If you think about where oxygen is on the periodic table, it's in group six and they form ions with a charge of two minus. And what we want to form is oxygen atoms. But what we know about oxygen is that it's diatomic. So once those atoms are formed, two atoms will join up and form a diatomic oxygen molecule. So we've got O2 minus ions forming O2 molecules. We need to balance this half equation in terms of atoms and then in terms of charge. So you can see that we have two oxygen atoms on the right. And so we actually need to put a two in front of our oxide ions because we will need two oxide ions to form one oxygen molecule because a molecule is made up of two atoms. So each of those oxide ions will form an oxygen atom and then two of those will bond together to form the molecule. And then we need to balance our half equation in terms of charge. So on the left hand side, what is your charge? Well, you can see that you have two oxide ions, each with a charge of minus two. So that gives us a charge of minus four overall, two multiplied by minus two. On the right hand side, there's no positives or negatives, so it has a charge of zero. So which side do I need to add my electrons to? I need to add them to the right hand side. That's the side that needs to go down in charge. 
So I add my electrons to the right hand side and how many am I going to need to balance the charge? Well, each electron is minus one, so I'm going to need four of them. That brings the charge in the right hand side down to minus four. And so that is balanced. So what is happening overall at the anode? Well, for each oxygen molecule that is formed, we have two oxide ions that are attracted to the anode. Each of those oxide ions lose two electrons each. So overall, four electrons are produced and that's why we see plus four electrons on the right hand side. And we form two oxygen atoms which combine to form an oxygen molecule. So you can see from the formula of your ion that each oxide ion needs to lose two electrons. But we can also see that by just simply writing a half equation. And that's a really important half equation to learn. It's a half equation that people can get mixed up with just because of the two minus charge um, and also the, the two balancing number in front of the oxide ions. So it's worth actually just learning that half equation in case you need to write it. What about the cathode then? Well, the cathode is negatively charged. So what's going to be attracted to it? Well, it's going to be our cations that are attracted to it, which is always our metal. And in this case, it's our aluminium ions. So our aluminium ions are positively charged. They are cations. And so they are attracted to our negative cathode. And you can see, remember, that is the electrode that's running along the lining of the cell, essentially around the outside of the cell. If you look on the periodic table, aluminium is in group 3, which means that it has a 3 plus charge when it is an ion. So what we need to think about is what needs to happen to aluminium to get it to become an atom, to have no overall charge. Well, you can see it has a charge of 3 plus, so it's actually going to need to gain 3 electrons to cancel out that 3 plus charge. And what it will form is an aluminium atom. So if we start to write our half equation here at the bottom, how do we balance this? Well, on the left hand side, our charge is plus three. On our right hand side, the charge is zero. So which side do we need to add electrons to? We need to add it to the left hand side this time to bring it down in charge. So we write plus a minus, but how many electrons do we need to cancel out that plus three charge? We're going to need three in total. And that brings the charge on our left hand side down to zero. So again, you can write it in terms of a half equation or you can think what's actually happening to those aluminium atoms. What do they need to do um, to get back to aluminium atoms with no overall charge? Well, if they have a charge of three plus, they need to gain three electrons. So it might be worth noting that at the cathode, each aluminium ion gains three electrons. And so your half equation is Al3 plus, plus three electrons and Aru Al. So that's what happens in the electrolysis of aluminium oxide um, on an industrial scale. So at the anode, your oxide ions are attracted. They lose electrons and form oxygen molecules. And that's why actually you can see little bubbles there um, in your diagram. Those are bubbles of oxygen. Because remember, oxygen is a gas. So if you were asked, what are the observations of the anode? You would see that bubbles of colorless gas are given off. So you may want to um, add that to your notes that bubbles of colorless gas are formed. At the cathode, you're forming aluminium. At this temperature, the aluminium will be molten. And so you can see here from your diagram that the aluminium will sink to the bottom um, when it's no longer attracted to the cathode when it has formed aluminium atoms. And you can see there it is tapped off, a bit like in the blast furnace where the iron sinks to the bottom and ta is tapped off. It's exactly the same here. The molten aluminium that is formed sinks to the bottom of the cell where it is tapped off. Again, that's quite a common question in an exam. How is the aluminium removed from the, um, from the cell? And that's just that it sinks to the bottom and is tapped off. I'm going to look um, at a few of the industrial implications of this process now. So over on the next page, we're going to look at some issues um, 
associated with um, aluminium extraction using electrolysis um, and also some factors to consider when you are deciding where you're going to put an aluminium extraction plant. And so first of all, let's look at the issues with aluminium extraction uh, using electrolysis. And so essentially both of these are financial reasons. Um, electrolysis is very expensive and has large costs associated with it because we have to keep um, the reaction happening at a very high temperature and that's to keep our um, electrolyte or aluminium oxide molten because remember electrolysis only works when the electrolyte is a liquid because otherwise as a solid the ions are in a fixed position and cannot move to the electrodes and also um, it's electrolysis, it requires electricity and if you're having this going on constantly throughout the day in an extraction plant then there are going to be large amounts of electricity used. So actually this is a very expensive process. And so actually you have to consider the worth of the metal. Is it useful? It Does it have um, a lot of um, purposes? Because if not, if there's an alternative metal that you could use that would be cheaper to extract, then, it's, then it would be worth using that. But aluminium is a very useful metal. It's used in many different um, things from electric wiring, um, because it's such a good conductor of electricity, um, to even aircraft, because it is such a light metal. So it is a very useful metal, so it's worth going through this process to extract it, but it is very expensive. And that's because of the high temperatures used Used, and because of the large amount of electricity that we need to use as well. But there's another downside of using high temperatures, not just that it's very expensive to maintain those high temperatures, but actually because um, of a reaction that happens at the anode. So remember, what is being formed at the anode? At the anode, we have oxygen being formed. Remember, our oxide ions will be attracted to the anode they lose electrons and form oxygen molecules. Those will bubble away from the anode, but you're having oxygen produced around this anode. What is the anode made out of? The anode is made out of graphite. And what element is graphite? If you remember from your year 11 studies, graphite is an allotrope, a structural form of carbon. So what we've got here is carbon, and we have got oxygen being formed at this carbon electrode. What happens when carbon reacts with oxygen? Well, we form carbon dioxide. So essentially, over time, that carbon in the anode is wearing away because it's reacting with the oxygen that is being formed at the anode and it's forming carbon dioxide, which will bubble away. So as that carbon reacts with oxygen, it's forming carbon dioxide, which is a gas which bubbles away. So the carbon is going to wear away as it reacts with oxygen. And that's all because of the high temperatures used. Now this seems like a really small part of your notes, but actually this question is asked all the time and it can be worth up to three marks. So highlight it, put a massive star at it, whatever you need to do. This point is really important and actually it's worth just learning this explanation off word for word um, because as I say, it can be worth up to three marks. So you need to say due to the high temperatures used. Sometimes you lose a mark if you don't say due to the high temperatures used because if we weren't using high temperatures this reaction might not happen as readily high, high temperatures increase the rate of reaction and um, so because we're using high temperatures to keep the electrolyte molten this reaction happens even quicker and um, so we have got an anode that is made out of carbon and that reacts with the oxygen which is produced at the anode you need to say that really clearly so you're thinking the anode is made out of carbon graphite um, oxygen is being formed at the anode, so those two things are reacting together to form carbon dioxide. According to the equation, C plus O2 reacting to give CO2. So from that equation, it's the carbon from the anode and it's the oxygen that is made at the anode and that's forming carbon dioxide. Therefore, over time, the anodes gradually wear away 
and so they must be replaced peri periodically and that again has financial implications as well because you're replacing them um, and that costs money as well. So actually these two bullet points, the fact that we need to use high temperatures and large amounts of electricity, that adds to the high costs of electrolysis. Um, but also because of the high temperatures used, the anodes react with the oxygen produced at them to form carbon dioxide. Therefore, they wear away and must be replaced periodically. So you need to know those two bullet points, especially that second one, in a lot of detail. So while it looks like a small part of your notes, it's really, really important. This next part as well, how do we reduce the cost of aluminium extraction? So we've just seen that this is a really expensive process for a few different reasons. And you'll remember that step two of this process was that we dissolve the aluminium oxide after it's been purified in something called molten cryolite. And again, this can be um, a two mark question. They can ask you, why is molten cryolite added? Um, and that's it's really to reduce the operating cost, to lower the cost of um, the electrolysis of aluminium oxide for two reasons. Um, one is that it reduces the melting point of aluminium oxide. So the first reason is that it reduces the melting point of aluminium oxide. And so the operating temperature is reduced. So remember, we need to keep the aluminium oxide as a liquid um, and we will have to heat it up to a certain temperature to keep it as a liquid. And you may think it, it will just reduce it by a little bit, but actually it has a massive impact. The melting point temperature is reduced from 2050 degrees to 950 degrees C. So that's a massive reduction. So rather than having to heat it up to 2050 degrees to get the aluminium oxide to melt, we only have to heat it up to 950 degrees C and keep it at that. And um, so that's a massive, massive difference. You don't need to learn those exact figures, but it's just to give you an idea of how effective this molten cryolite is. So it reduces the melting point, so the operating temperature is reduced. We don't have to heat it up just as much to um, get it to be molten. And what it also does is it increases the conductivity of aluminium oxide. So essentially, electricity is conducted better through the um, circuit. And so we don't need to apply as much external electricity um, so you can see the two advantages here of um, adding molten cryolite. One is that it reduces the melting point and the other is that it increases the conductivity of aluminium oxide. So therefore we're not having to heat it to as high a temperature and not having to apply just as much um, electricity. Um, so if you can try and remember one goes down, one goes up. So reduces the melting point and increases the conductivity. Um, another thing that um, reduces the cost of aluminium extraction, and you may have seen this in um, the video that you watched with the, with, um, the previous YouTube video, the previous teaching video, um, you watched a, a, a separate YouTube video and that showed you the extraction of aluminium oxide, or perhaps if you didn't watch the end, um, you could do that now um, because you'll see the extraction of aluminium and you will have actually noticed in the um, in the video, this solid crust of aluminium oxide forming on the surface of the electrolyte. Um, so you can imagine just like this crust forming on the top and that prevents heat loss, which again means we're not having to apply as much energy to keep it at such a high temperature because um, heat loss is being prevented. Um, so it's worth highlighting that as well. So that again reduces the cost of aluminium extraction um, because the solar crust of aluminium oxide is keeping the heat in. So again, we're not losing heat, not having to apply as much external heat. And then we're going to have a quick look um, at the factors that we need to consider when we are siting an aluminium extraction plant. Essentially, what this means is if we were setting up a new aluminium extraction plant, what would we have to consider um, when we were deciding where do we put it? And I would love to say that learning two or three of these would be safe, but 
technically speaking, they could make this into a six mark question. There used to be something on the course, it's not on the course anymore, about um, deciding where to put a limestone quarry. Um, that's not on the course anymore, but that was previously a six mark question in kind of putting the advantages and disadvantages of it and um, factors to consider on where to put it. So technically speaking, they could turn this into a six mark question. Um, it's never been done before, but that doesn't mean they couldn't do it. Um, so have a read through these, make sure that you understand them. Basically, um, for this extraction plant, because we're using a large amount of electricity, um, we must be... Um, we must put the extraction plant near a good electricity supply, um, especially um, near a renewable source such as hydroelectric power or a wind turbine or whatever, because that will improve the sustainability of the plant as well. Um, we also need to have good local sources of the raw material, for example, bauxite, cryolite and carbon for our electrodes because you don't want large costs associated with shipping those in from um, a far off place. Um, you need good sea, rail and road transportation links for the delivery of materials, your bauxite, cryolite and carbon, um, and for everything else that you need to set up the plant, um, for transport of the workforce and transport of waste away from the site, um, and also your products away from the site as well, your aluminium. You need good water supply for washing, dissolving and cooling of your machinery and steam generation. You need a reasonable size of local population with the skills and knowledge required to work at the plant. So essentially you need workers at the plant um, and they generally will be local people. Um, so that needs to be sussed out as well. And then not close to any conservation areas or areas of outstanding natural beauty because um, these extraction plants, they're essentially like big factories. So they're not going to be particularly pleasing to look at um, and so therefore we don't need, want them near tourist areas or conservation areas in particular. So again probably safe learning a couple of these but again they could ask you a more detailed question on it um, but it's just common sense of um, what you need to consider when you're when you're setting up an extraction plant. And then lastly in this topic, over on the top of page 10, make sure you don't um, miss this, maybe highlight it, just so that you know it's part of your notes before the questions start. Um, we just need to look briefly at recycling aluminium. So that is something that you'll be familiar with, that we can recycle aluminium for the likes of um, aluminium cans you'll be used to recycling. Um, and the reason we do that is because it is only a fraction of the cost of extracting new aluminium from bauxite using electrolysis. It's also much better from the environment in that it reduces carbon dioxide emissions um, because again we're using very high temperatures um, in this electrolysis process and so that will require burning fuels um, which will release carbon dioxide um, and also the production of the electricity could um, release carbon dioxide as well unless we do it from a renewable source and also we saw that carbon dioxide is produced at the anodes um, because of the high temperatures used. The anodes are made out of carbon, oxygen is produced at them and so carbon dioxide is formed. Um, so we've got a lot of carbon dioxide emissions um, from the electrolysis process and so if we recycle aluminium that will reduce carbon dioxide emissions. It also saves money because we remember electrolysis um, is a very expensive process. It saves energy because again, electrolysis is a high energy um, process. It has high energy requirements um, and also resources because your bauxite extracting, um, even extracting that um, in itself from the ground as such is an expensive process and resources such as your cryolites and even your workforce and paying those people um so recycling aluminium is um far better and finally it also prevents waste from going into the landfill so if you've got an aluminium can and um, you have the choice whether you put it in the black bin or your blue bin and um, your recycling bin um, and if you do recycle it then it prevents it from going to the landfill so that's the electrochemistry topic finished. There's a lot of detail in that um, industrial extraction of aluminium. If there's anything you're not sure, please go over it again. Um, 
and genuinely this has made up up to 12 marks on a um, paper before so make sure you know it inside out there have been a couple of occasions where you've had six mark questions on this process and um, because they've asked you to um, talk about what is the name of the ore and um, what is made at each electrode and um why do the anodes have to be replaced periodically and how is aluminium removed from the cell all of those details are in your notes it's only just over two um, pages and make sure you learn those details really really well so what i would like you to do now you should have had questions one to five already completed and um, but if you don't please complete questions one to five but as i said those should already be completed but what i do want you to do is complete question six so over on page 11 in your notes, um, you have question six, which you didn't answer last week because um, we didn't cover that in the first video. And so I'd like you to complete question six now. So if you complete that just after questions one to five, wherever you did that last week. So complete question six in your blue book or file paper. Um, and then you also have exam questions and um, past paper questions, which you either picked up if you were able to get into school um, or I will upload on Google Classroom. Um, it might be easier just to print those and complete them or again, complete them in your book or file paper if you don't have a printer. And um, so once you've finished completing your notes with this video, complete question six and then complete your um, past paper questions. Those are just a selection of the past paper questions that I could have chosen from. It comes up every single year on the uh, questions on this topic and it shows that you need to know it in detail. Um, but actually, um, you could summarize this topic very well, learning your half equations, observations um, and your industrial extraction of aluminium from its ore so it's worth going through the topic first of all maybe making summary notes and then completing those exam questions you will get all of your answers from your notes there's nothing in those questions that you cannot do without your notes so please use your notes please try your hardest at those questions as i said in the first video this can be a tricky topic to get your head around but once you've got your head around it and um, it will just click and hopefully it should make sense well so if you need to watch anything in the video again please do um, and what you will see is that um, similar exam questions come up all the time so it's worth doing the past paper practice of it and even looking through the past papers that you have and doing some extra questions of um, from this topic because um, there's it's a short-ish topic and so they can only ask you a certain amount of questions in a certain way and um, so the more past paper practice you get in this topic the easier you will find it.